Hello, I'm Ted Hope. I'm the executive director of the San Francisco Film Society. And I want to welcome you to the 56th edition of the San Francisco International Film Festival. The film industry is often characterized as being filled with narcissistic, malcontent, misanthropic individuals. And I think it's, it would be wrong to say that wouldn't be giving it a bad shake. But uh, luckily, it's also filled with other types of individuals, too. Um, some of tremendous gener generosity of spirit. When I first started, and the first movie I raised money for was a one-man show for an actor named Ron Vowder, who was dying of AIDS. And we had about four weeks to put together the money to make this movie happen. And things were getting pretty desperate. And I did what people told me not to do, which was call a friend and say, do you have Steven Soderbergh's phone number? And I called him, called him cold and told him what I was doing. And he asked, what can I do to make it happen? And he not only helped get that money in place so that we could shoot, he showed up for the shoot and brought his friends with him. And that kind of generosity really helped give me the inspiration to go forward and make a lot of movies that I felt were impossible to make. There are filmmakers who try to just prove what they know, that give a recitation with each movie. And then there are those filmmakers who are willing to experiment, to take each one as a learning experience and try to lift that bar a little bit higher. And I think if you look at Stephen's career, you see that, that he never plays it safe. He always takes chances. And with his films, they are always about something. Even when he's playful, playing, working with genre, they're about subjects life today that many filmmakers refuse to touch. So in looking at somebody to come and address what is the state of cinema today, for my inaugural, this is my maybe 56 years for San Francisco, but this is my first film festival, trying to find somebody that has truly worked to elevate the state of cinema for us all with both a, a generosity of spirit and a keen awareness of the world today who better than Steven so Soderbergh? A few months ago, I was on this JetBlue flight going from New York to Burbank. And I like JetBlue, not just because of the prices, but they have this um, terminal at JFK that I think is really nice. I think it may be the nicest terminal in the country, although I have to say this country, if you want to see some great airports, you got to go to a major city in like another part of the world like Europe or Asia. They're amazing, amazing airports. They're incredible and they're quiet. You know, you're not being assaulted by all this music all the time. I, I don't know when it was decided that we all need a soundtrack everywhere we go. I was just in the bathroom upstairs and, and there's a soundtrack accompanying me at the urinal. I don't understand. Anyway, so um, I'm getting comfortable in my seat. You know, I spent the 60 bucks to get the, the extra leg room, so I'm starting to get a little comfortable and we make altitude. And uh, there's a guy, he's on the other side of the aisles in front of me and he pulls out his iPad, he's gonna start watching stuff. And I'm curious to see what he's gonna watch. He's like a white guy in his mid-30s. And uh, I begin to realize that what he's done is he's loaded in half a dozen sort of action extravaganzas, and he's watching each of the action sequences. He's skipping over all the dialogue and the, and the narrative. And it's just, so this guy's flight is gonna be five and a half hours of just like mayhem porn. <laughs> And so I get this wave of, it was not panic, it's not like my, my heart started fluttering, but I had this sense of, am I going insane, or is the world going insane, or both? And so now I start with the circular thinking. I think, okay, maybe it's me, maybe it's generational, I'm getting old, I'm on the back nine now, you know, I'm older than Elvis. Um, you know, and maybe my 22-year-old daughter doesn't feel this way at all. I should, I should ask her. Um, but then I think, no, something, something is going on. Something that can be measured is happening 
And it, there has to be, when, when people are more outraged by the ambiguous ending of The Sopranos than some young girl being stoned to death, then there's something wrong. We have people walking around who think the government stages these terrorist attacks. And anybody with a, a brain bigger than a walnut knows that our government is not nearly competent enough <laughs> to stage a terrorist attack and then keep it a secret because as we know, in this day and age, you cannot keep a secret. So I think, you know, maybe it's like a, I start thinking of it like uh, life is sort of like a drum beat, you know, and it has a rhythm and sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower. And maybe what's happening is this drum beat is just accelerating and it's gotten to the point where I can't hear between the beats anymore and it's just a hum. And again, I thought, uh, I, I'm, I, I get back to, okay, but maybe that's my generation, maybe every generation feels that way. Maybe I should ask my daughter. But then I remembered somebody did uh, this experiment where if you're in a car and you're going more than 20 miles an hour, it becomes impossible to distinguish individual features on a human being's face. And I thought, well, that's another good analogy for this sensation that I'm feeling. I'm also thinking that's a very weird experiment for somebody to come up with. Um, and so that was my JetBlue flight. <laughs> but the, uh, the circular thinking didn't really stop. And um, I got my hands on a book by a guy named Douglas Rushkoff and realized that I'm suffering from something called present shock, which is the name of his book. And this quote made me feel a little less insane. When there's no linear time, how is a person supposed to figure out what's going on? There's no story, no narrative to explain why things are the way they are. Previously distinct causes and effects collapse into one another. There's no time between doing something and seeing the result. Instead, the results begin accumulating and influencing us before we've even completed an action. And there's so much information coming in at once from so many different sources that there's simply no way to trace the plot over time. So that's sort of the hum that I'm talking about. And I mention this because I think it's having an effect on all of us. I think it's having an effect on our culture. And I think it's having um, an effect on movies, how they're made, um, how they're sold, how they perform. Um, but before we talk about movies, we should probably talk about art in general, if, if, if that's possible. Given all the incredible suffering in the world, I wonder sometimes what, what, what is art for, really? I mean, if the collected works of Shakespeare can't prevent genocide, then really, what is it for? Shouldn't we be spending the time and resources sort of alleviating the suffering and helping other people instead of going to the movies and plays and art installations? I mean, I think about when we, when we did Ocean's 13, the casino set used $60,000 of electricity every week. Now, I, I, how do you justify that? Do you justify it by saying, well, you know, the people that could have had that electricity, you know, they can watch the movie for two hours and be entertained, except they probably can't because they don't have any electricity because we used it. Um, and then I think, what about all the resources spent on all the pieces of entertainment? What about the carbon footprint of getting me here? And I think, why am I even thinking that way when, and, and worrying about how, much, how many miles to the gallon my car gets when we have NASCAR and monster truck pools on TV. So what I, what I finally decided was, art is simply inevitable. It was on a, a, the wall of a cave in France 30,000 years ago. And it's because we are a species that's driven by narrative. And art is storytelling. We need to tell stories. We need to tell stories to pass along ideas and information and, and to try and make sense out of all this chaos. And sometimes, when you get a really good artist and a compelling story, you can, achieve, you can almost achieve that thing that's impossible, which is entering the consciousness of another human being and literally seeing the world 
the way they see it. And then, if you have a really good piece of art, a really good artist, you, you are altered in some way. And so the experience is transformative. And in the minute you're experiencing that piece of art, you're not alone. You're connected to the artist. So I feel like that can't be too bad. Art is also about problem solving. And it's obvious from the news uh, that we have a bit of a problem with um, problem solving. And uh, in my experience, the, the main obstacle to problem solving is an entrenched ideology. Um, the great thing about making a movie or a piece of art is that that never comes into play. All the ideas are on the table. Everything is open for discussion. And it turns out, you know, everybody succeeds by sort of submitting to what the thing needs to be. And art, in my view, is a very elegant sort of problem-solving model. Now we finally arrive at the subject of this rant, which is the state of cinema. First of all, is there a difference between cinema and movies? Yeah. If I were on Team America, I'd say, fuck yeah. Um, <laughs> The simplest way that I can describe it is a movie is something you see, and cinema is something that's made. And it has nothing to do with the capture medium, it doesn't have anything to do with where the screen is, whether it's in your bedroom, your iPad, it doesn't even really have to be a movie, it can be a commercial, it can be something on YouTube. Cinema is a specificity of vision. It's an approach in which everything matters. It's the polar opposite of generic or arbitrary, and the result is as unique as a signature or a fingerprint. And it isn't made by a committee, and it isn't made by a company, and it isn't made by the audience. It means that if this filmmaker didn't do it, it either wouldn't exist at all, or it wouldn't exist in anything like this form. So, that means you can take a perfectly solid, successful, uh, acclaimed movie, and it may not qualify as cinema. It also means you can take a piece of cinema and it may not qualify as a movie and it may actually be an unwatchable piece of shit. Um, but as long as you have filmmakers out there who have that specific point of view, then cinema is never going to disappear completely because it's not about money. It's about good ideas followed up by a well-developed aesthetic. And I love, this. I love all this new technology, it's great. Smaller, lighter, faster, you can make a really good looking movie for not a lot of money. And whenever people start to get weepy about celluloid, I think of uh, this quote by Orson Welles when somebody was talking to him about new technology, which he, he tended to embrace. And he said, I don't wanna wait on the tool, I want the tool to wait for me, which I thought was a good way to put it. But the problem is that cinema, as I define it, and as something that inspired me, is under assault by the studios, um, and from what I can tell, with the full support of the audience. Um, the reasons for this, in my opinion, are more economic than philosophical, but when you add an ample amount of fear, and a lack of vision, and a lack of leadership, you've got a trajectory that I think is, is pretty difficult to reverse. Now, of course, it's very subjective. There's, there are going to be exceptions to everything I'm going to say, and I'm just saying that so no one thinks I'm talking about them. Um, <laughs> and I want to be clear, the, the idea of cinema as I'm defining it is not on the radar of the studios. Like, this is not a conversation anybody's having. It's not a word you would ever want to use in a meeting. Um, and, you know, speaking of meetings, I mean, the meetings, the meetings have gotten pretty weird. There, there are fewer and fewer uh, executives who are in the business because they love movies. There are fewer and fewer executives that know movies. So it can become a very strange situation. I mean, I know how to drive a car, but I wouldn't presume to sit in a meeting with an engineer and tell him how to build one. And that's kind of what you feel like when, when you're in these meetings. You've got people who don't know movies, don't watch movies for pleasure, deciding what movie you're going to be allowed to make. And that's one reason studio movies aren't better than they are, and it's one reason that cinema 
as I'm defining it, is shrinking. Well, how does a studio decide what movies get made? One thing they take into consideration is the foreign market, obviously. It's become very big. Um, so that means, you know, the things that travel best are going to be um, action adventure, science fiction, fantasy, you know, spectacle, um, some, some animation thrown in there. Obviously, the bigger the budget, the more people this thing is going to have to appeal to, the more homogenized it's got to be, the more simplified it's got to be. So things like cultural specificity, narrative complexity, and God forbid ambiguity, um, you know, those become real obstacles to the success of the film here and abroad. Speaking of ambiguity, we had a test screening of Contagion once, and um, a guy in a focus group stood up and he said, I really hate the Jude Law character. I don't know if he's a hero or an asshole. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. Um, <laughs> there's another thing, a process known as running the numbers. And if you're a filmmaker, this is kind of the equivalent of a doctor uh, showing you your chest x-ray and saying there's a shadow on it. Um, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of fungible algorithm uh, that, that's used when, when they want to say no without really saying no. Uh, I could tell you a really, a really good story of how I got um, pushed off a movie because of, uh, you know, the way the numbers ran. Um, but if I did, I, I'd probably get shot in the street. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I really like my cats. Um, so then there's the expense of putting a movie out which is a big problem. Point of entry for a mainstream wide release movie, $30 million. That's where you start. Now you add another 30 for overseas. Now you gotta remember, the exhibitors take half of the gross. So to get that 60 back, you've gotta gross 120. Now, so that's, you haven't even, you don't even know what your movie is yet, and you're, you're already looking at 120. So that ended up being part of the reason why the Liberace movie didn't happen at a studio. We only needed $5 million from a domestic partner. But when you add the cost of putting a movie out, now you're talking about you've got to grow $70 million to get that 35 back. And the feeling, I think, amongst the studios was uh, this material was too special um, <laughs> to gross. $70 million. So the obstacle here isn't just that, that special subject matter, um, but it's that nobody has figured out how to reduce the cost of putting a movie out. I think there have been some attempts to sort of analyze it, um, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the mysteries is that um, this analysis doesn't really reveal any kind of line, linear predictive behavior. It's still kind of mysterious, the process by which people decide to either go to a movie or not go to a movie. And sometimes you, you, so you, sometimes you, didn't know, you don't even know how you reached them. Um, like on Magic Mike, for instance, the movie opened to $38 million. The tracking said we were going to open to 19. So the tracking was 100% wrong. <laughs> and you know, it's really nice when the surprise goes in that direction, but you, it's hard not to sit there and go, how did we, how, how did we miss that? If, if this is our tracking, how do you miss by that much? So I know, one, I know one person who works in marketing at a studio suggested on a modestly budgeted film that had some sort of brand identity and some A-list talent attached, and she suggested, look, why don't we not do any tracking at all, and let's just spend 15 and put it out, and, and let's see if that works. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They were afraid it, was, they were afraid it would fail when they failed doing the other thing all the time. So I don't, maybe they were afraid it was going to work. Um, the other thing that mystifies me is you would think in terms of spending, if you have one of these you know, big franchise sequels that you would say, oh, you know, we don't have to spend as much money because, I mean, is there anyone in the, in, in the galaxy that doesn't know Iron Man's opening on Friday? So you would think, oh, we can stop carpet bombing, you know, with TV commercials. It's exactly the opposite. They spend, they spend more. 
they spend more. Their attitude is, well, you know, but it's a sequel, and it's the third one, and we got to make sure that, you know, that people really want to go, and we want to make sure that opening weekend number is big so that the perception of the movie is that it's a huge success. And so, you know, there's that, and then the, if you've ever wondered why every poster and every trailer and every, every TV spot looks exactly the same, it's because of testing. It's because anything interesting scores poorly and gets kicked out. Now, I've tried to argue that the methodology of this testing isn't, it, it doesn't work. That if you take a poster or a trailer and you show it to somebody in isolation, that's not really an accurate reflection of whether it's working because we don't see them in isolation. We see them in groups. We see a trailer in the middle of five other trailers. We see a poster in the middle of eight other posters. And I, I've tried to argue that, well, maybe the thing that's making it distinctive and score poorly actually sticks out, would stick out if you, if you presented them to these people the way the real world presents it, and I, I've never won that argument. Um, you know, we had a trailer for side effects that was done in London, and the filmmaking team really, really liked it. Well, the problem was it wasn't testing well, and it was really not testing as well as this domestic trailer that... Um, that we had, and, and the point spread was so significant that I really couldn't justify um, trying to jam this thing down the distributor's throat, so we had to abandon it. Now, look, not all testing is bad. Sometimes you have to, especially if you have a comedy. You know, and there's nothing like 400 people who are not your friends to tell you when something's wrong. I just don't think you can use it as the last word on a movie's playability or its quality. Magic Mike tested poorly, really poorly. And fortunately, Warner Brothers just ignored the test scores and stuck with their plan to open the movie wide during the summer. But let's go back to side effects for a second. This is a movie that didn't perform as well as any of us wanted it to. So why? What happened? Uh, I mean, it can't be the campaign because, you know, all the materials that we had, the trailers and the posters and the TV spots, all that stuff tested well above average. Um, February 8th, maybe, was it the date? Was that a bad date? It, well, as it turns out, that was the Friday after the Oscar nominations are announced, and this year, uh, there was an atypically large bump to all the films that got nominated, so that was a factor. Then there was a, a storm uh, in the Northeast, which was sort of our core audience, Nemo came in, so God, obviously, is... Um, <laughs> is uh, getting me back for my comments about monotheism. Um, <laughs> was it the concept? You know, there was a very active decision early on to sell the movie as kind of a pure thriller and, and sort of disconnected from this larger social issue of everybody taking pills. Now, did that make the movie seem more commercial or did it make it seem more generic? We don't know. What about the cast? Well four attractive white people. This is usually not an obstacle. Um, the exit polls were very good. The reviews were good. How do we figure out what, what went wrong? And, and the answer is we don't because everybody's already moved on to the next movie they have to release. Now, I'm gonna to attempt to show how a certain kind of rodent might be smarter than a studio when it comes to picking projects. <laughs> if you give a certain kind of rodent the option of hitting two buttons, and one of the buttons when you touch it dispenses food 40% of the time, and one of the buttons when you touch it dispenses food 60% of the time, this certain kind of rodent very quickly figures out never to touch the 40% button ever again. So, when a studio is attempting to determine on a project-by-project -project basis what will work, instead of backing a talented filmmaker over the long haul, they're actually increasing their chances of choosing wrong. Because, in my view, in this business, which is totally talent-driven, it's about horses, not races. And I think, if I were gonna run a studio, I would just be gathering the best filmmakers I could find and sort of let them do their thing within certain economic parameters. So I would call, you know, 
Shane Carruth or Barry Jenkins or Amy Simons, and I'd bring them in and go, okay, what do, you, what do you want to do? What are the things that you're interested in doing? What do we have here that you might be interested in doing? And if there was some sort of point of intersection, you go, okay, look, I'm going to let you make three movies over five years. I'm going to give you this much money in production costs. I'm going to dedicate this much money in marketing. You can sort of apportion it any way you want. You can spend it all on one and none on the other two. But, you know, go, go make something. Now, that only works if you are very, very good at identifying talent, real talent, the kind of talent that sustains. And you can't be judging strictly on sort of commercial performance or hype or hipness, but I don't think it's unreasonable to expect someone who's running a multi-billion dollar business to be able to identify talent. And I get it, look, I get it, it's the studio. You need all kinds of movies, you need comedies, you need horror films, you need action films, you need animated films, you need, I, I get it. But the point is, can't some of these be cinema also? I mean, this is sort of what we tried to do with Section 8, was to try and bring interesting filmmakers into the studio system and protect them. But unfortunately, the only way a studio is gonna allow that kind of freedom to a, a young filmmaker is if the budgets are low. And unfortunately, the most profitable movies for the studios are the big movies, the home runs. You know, they don't look at the singles and the doubles as being worth the money or the man hours. And psychologically, it's more comforting to spend $60 million promoting a movie that cost 100 than it does to spend $60 million promoting a movie that cost 10. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, oh, but you know, if it costs 10, you're gonna be in profit sooner. Maybe not, here's why. Okay, $10 million movie, 60 million to promote it, that's 70, so you gotta gross 140 to get out. Now you got a $100 million movie, you're gonna spend 60 to promote it, you gotta get 320 to get out. How many $10 million movies make $140 million? Not many. How many $100 million movies make 320? A pretty good number. And there's a sort of domino effect that happens too. Bigger home video sales, bigger TV sales. So you can see the forces that are sort of draining in one direction in the business. So here's the thought, maybe, maybe nothing's wrong. You know, maybe I'm a clown. Maybe, um, uh, you know, the audiences are happy and the studio's happy. I mean, look at this from uh, Variety. Shrinking release slates, a focus on tent poles and the emergence of a new normal in the home vid market has allowed the largest media conglomes to boost the financial performance of their movie divisions, according to Nomura equity research analyst Michael Nathanson. So, according to Mr. Nathanson, the studios are successfully cutting costs, the decline in home videos plateaued, and the international box office, which used to be 50% of revenue, is now 70%. With one exception, all the stock prices, all the companies that own these studios are up. And it would appear that these companies are, are flush, so maybe nothing's wrong. And I gotta tell you, this is the only arena in history in which trickle-down economics actually works because when a studio is flushed, they spend more money to make more money because their stock price is all about market share. And you know, there's no other business that, that, that's this big that's actually this financially transparent. You know, you have a situation here in which there is an objective economic value given to an asset, okay? It's not like that derivatives mortgage bullshit that just brought the world to its knees that you can't say a movie made more money than it actually made. And internally, you can't say you didn't spend what you spent on it. It's contractual that you have to make these numbers available. Now, don't get me wrong, there's, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of waste. I think there are too many layers of executives. I don't know why you should be having, you know, a lot of phone calls with people that can't actually make decisions. Um, they'll violate their own rules on a whim while they make you adhere to them. Um, they get simple, simple things wrong sometimes, like remakes. I mean, why are, you, why are you always remaking the famous movies? Why aren't you looking back into your catalog 
and finding some sort of programmer that was made 50 years ago that has a really good idea in it, and that if you put some fresh talent on it, it could be really great. Well, of course, in order to do that, you need to have somebody at the studio that actually knows those movies. And, you know, but even if you don't have that person, you could hire one. Um, the, the sort of executive ecosystem is distorted because executives don't get punished for making bombs the way that filmmakers do. And the result is there's no turnover of new ideas. There's, there's, no, there's no new ideas about how to approach the business or how to deal with talent or material. But again, economically, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty straightforward business. And hell, it's the third biggest export uh, that we have. And it's one of the few things that we do that the world actually likes. Um, <laughs> I've, I've stopped being embarrassed about being in the film business. I really have. You know, at least I'm not spending my days trying to make a weapon that kills people more efficiently. It's, it's you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting business. But again, looking, taking the 30,000 foot view, maybe, maybe nothing's wrong. And maybe my feeling that the studios are kind of like Detroit before the bailout is just totally insupportable. I mean, I'm, I'm wrong a lot. I'm wrong so much, it doesn't even raise my blood pressure anymore. So, you know, maybe everything is just fine. But, <laughs> admissions. This is the number of bodies that go through the turnstile. 10 years ago, 1.52 billion. Last year, 1.36 billion. That's a 10.5% drop. Why are admissions dropping? Nobody knows, not even Nate Silver. Um, <laughs> probably a combination of things, uh, ticket prices maybe, uh, a lot of competition for eyeballs, you know, there's a lot of good TV out there. Um, theft is a big problem, and I know this is a really controversial subject, but um, I, for people who think everything on the internet should just be totally free, all I can say is, well, good luck when you try and you know, have a life and raise a family uh, living off of something you create. Uh, there's a great quote from Steve Jobs. From the earliest days at Apple, I realized that we thrived when we created intellectual property. If people copied or stole our software, we'd be out of business. If it weren't protected, there'd be no incentive for us to make new software or product designs. If protection of intellectual property begins to disappear, creative companies will disappear or never get started. But there's a simpler reason. It's wrong to steal, it hurts other people, and it hurts your own character. I do think, no, it's, I, I agree with him. Um, I do think that what people go to the movies for has changed since 9-11. Um, I, I still think the country is, is in, in some form of PTSD about that event and that we haven't really healed um, in, a, in, a, in any sort of um, complete way and that people are, as a result, looking more toward um, escapist entertainment. And look, I get it. There, there's, there's, a, there's a very good argument to be made that only somebody who has it really good would want to make a movie that makes you feel really bad. Um, people are working longer hours for less money these days, and maybe when they go to the movie, they want a break. I get it. But let's, let's sex this up with some more numbers. Um, <laughs> in 2003, 455 films released. 275 of those were independent, 180 were studio films. Last year, 677 films released. So you're not imagining things. There are a lot of movies opening every weekend. 549 of those were independent, 128 were studio films. So a 100% increase in independent films and a 28% drop in studio films, and yet, 10 years ago, studio market share, 69%. Last year, 76%. So you got fewer studio movies now taking up a bigger piece of the pie, and you've got twice as many independent films scrambling for a smaller piece of the pie. That's hard. That's really hard. I mean, when I was coming up, making an independent film and trying to reach an audience, I thought was sort of like trying to, trying to hit a thrown baseball. 
this is like trying to hit a thrown baseball with another thrown baseball. And that's why I'm spending so much time talking to you about the business and the money, because this is the force that is pushing cinema out of mainstream movies. And you know, I've been in, a me I've been in meetings where I can, f I can feel it slipping away, where I can feel like I'm, they're, they're, the ideas that I'm tossing out are, I don't know, they're too scary or they're too weird, and I can feel the thing, it's just, it's just I can tell like it's not gonna happen, I'm not gonna be able to convince them to do this the way I think it should be done, and I wanna jump up on the table and scream and go, do you know how lucky we are to be doing this? Do you understand that the only way to repay that karmic debt is to make something good, is to make something ambitious, something beautiful, something memorable. But I, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, I sat there and I smiled. Um, and I don't know, you know, maybe these ideas, I, I don't know if they'd work. I mean, the only way to find out is uh, someone's gotta give me half a billion dollars to see if it'll work. I mean, that seems like a lot of money, right? Uh, but actually, in point of fact, there's a couple movies coming down the pike that represent, in terms of their budgets and their marketing campaigns, individually, a half a billion dollars. So, um, just one movie. Just give me one, one of these big movies. No? All right. <laughs> Kickstarter. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, bring this to a conclusion on a down note. A few years back, I got a call from an agent. He said, look, uh, will you come see this film? It's a little small independent film a client of mine made. It's, um, it's been making the, the festival circuit. It's been getting a really good response, but no distributor will pick it up. And I really would just like you to take a look at it and tell me what you think. The film is called Memento. So the lights come up and I go, all right, it's fucking, it's over. It's over. Nobody will buy this film and release it. This is insane. It's over. The movie, but it's just over. It was really upsetting. Well, fortunately, the people who financed the movie loved the movie so much, they formed their own distribution company and put the movie out and made $25 million. So whenever I despair, I think, okay, somebody out there somewhere, while we're sitting right here, somebody out there somewhere is, is making something cool that we're, we're gonna love, and, and that keeps me going. The other thing I tell young filmmakers, um, when, when you're gonna go in, when you're gonna go in and you're trying to get money, you're, you're, you're going into one of those rooms to try and convince somebody to make it, I don't care who you're pitching, I don't care what you're pitching, it can be about genocide, it can be about child killers, it can be about the worst kind of criminal injustice that you can imagine. But as you're sort of in the process of, of telling this story, sort of stop yourself in the middle of a sentence and, and sort of, you know, almost like you're having an epiphany and say, you know what? At the end of this day, this is a movie about hope. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to thank you all for coming. You know, and my takeaway on Stephen's words is just how much when we respond to movies that do have that ambition, that do have that level of creativity, that do offer us that hope, how much it's on us to make sure that we say this is what we want. We want more of these to tell our friends, to use Facebook and Twitter and all those things to say please support that. That's what we have 156 of those films here at the festival. So please go see them, please share them, and let's have a lot more of them, because the state of cinema can be very hopeful. So thank you very much. <laughs>